It has been over four years since the first case of COVID-19 was confirmed here in the tri-state. Hasn't disappeared and cases are actually rising in many parts of the country. As we get closer to fall, we'll take a closer look at the current state of COVID-19 in our region. That's next on WNIN Newsmakers. To WNIN Newsmakers, I'm Jessica Costello, evening news anchor for Eyewitness News. Joining us now is Dr. W. Graham Carlos, an Indiana University professor of medicine and the executive medical director at Eskenazi Health. Dr. Carlos, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm happy to be here with you this morning here in Evansville. Well, we have a lot to talk about, so let me start with a broad question. Where are we currently at with COVID-19 in Indiana? So COVID has changed into a new variant. It's called the KP3 variant. So we had the Omicron virus you may have heard of in the past. It has mutated. So this new variant is a little bit more infectious or contagious mm -hmm. than it's been in the past. The cases are on the rise. So we're above 20% case positivity for the new variant. And I'm sure you are seeing in your friends and family people saying, hey, I got COVID, I'm out of work, I'm having symptoms, I've lost taste and smell again. Can you believe we're doing this again? So we're certainly seeing cases, but people are not landing in the intensive care unit. They are not dying from this strain like we saw in the first variants. That's the good news. So you say patients aren't dying and maybe they're not going to the hospitals for it, but it is still a severe strain. Yes, it's still a virus that will make people quite ill with a high fever, muscle aches, loss of taste and smell, not wanting to get out of bed or off the couch for a couple days. Uh, and in our most vulnerable, in our elderly, in people with immune conditions, certainly it's scarier. And thankfully now we have some treatments that are available for those types of patients. Well, in Indiana, how has the surge compared to other states or just on a national level? And how does that compare to surges in the past? So like many viruses, as kiddos go back to school, uh, we see an uptick and we certainly have seen that here this fall. Uh, out east, kids are just starting to go back to school and sure enough, their cases are climbing. Here in Indiana, many of you know well that our kids go back a little earlier, late July, early August. So we've been seeing this now for a few weeks. My contacts around the country are all pretty much seeing the same thing. Increases in cases, but people are not getting severely or deathly ill, thankfully. And you just brought up a, a big topic. Obviously, it's back to school time, and parents want to protect their children from any illness. How can parents take that first step to hopefully not getting COVID or really anything in the classrooms? Well, all those things that we've heard about all our lives, good hand hygiene, staying home if you're sick, staying home if you have a fever. Uh, I think it's good to test and know what you're dealing with, particularly if you're in a household where you have a kid and you're also living with your parents and they're elderly and they're at risk. It's good to know what you're dealing with to try to mask up and isolate. Um, otherwise though, kids, even if they get this virus, it seems to be a, a mild cold, much like the common cold that we're all accustomed to. And kids generally do really well with it. So they, they get through it, uh, but again, keep them out and away if they have fevers as you would for any virus. Now, if a child does test positive for COVID or an adult or anybody, um, what should the next steps be? And I know isolation, the isolation period has changed over the years, really. So what does that look like now? Yeah, so um, once you test positive, I think one of the more important things anybody could do would to try to be to keep that individual away from at-risk people. Mm -hmm. So elderly folks, folks that are on chemotherapy, um, people that have chronic conditions, because we don't want them to, to catch the virus. Uh, masking can help to, to a degree in those scenarios. Uh, the CDC is recommending that everybody consider your COVID shot with your flu shot this fall. And this is no surprise to all of us in healthcare. Even a year, two years ago, we all saw this virus as becoming endemic, meaning mm -hmm. it's gonna circulate every year, much like the flu, 
and it's a good idea to get vaccinated. So that's one of the ways that we can all protect ourselves and those that we live, work, and play with from getting COVID. So let's let's pivot now to vaccines. Can you just walk us through how vaccines have changed over the years for COVID-19? I know we have, um, you know, Pfizer and Moderna, uh, but if there's somebody out there that hasn't gotten their COVID-19 vaccine and with the new strain is thinking about getting a vaccine, how do they determine which one is right for them? Great. So there's two important things to know about vaccines. The first one is that getting a vaccine for any condition doesn't prevent you from getting that condition. It prevents you from getting seriously ill or dying from it. So one of the myths out there is, oh, I got my COVID shot and I still got COVID, or I got the flu shot and I got the flu. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the point of this? Well, the point is that we on the, in the hospital side, on the healthcare side, we see when people get the vaccine, they get a mild illness. And the reason is that you are priming or alerting your immune system, hey, be on the lookout. You might see this virus in a couple months. And if you do, we want you to be ready. We want you to have the cellular preparedness to kill this thing quick so it doesn't overwhelm the host or the patient. So the first thing to know about vaccines is you can get a vaccine and still get the virus, but it should be mild. The second thing to know is that uh, your body has memory. So much like our brains have memory and we can remember things from a year or two previously or even longer, um, your immune system has memory. So every time you get a vaccine, even if it's for the different strains of the flu or COVID, your body remembers it for years. So that if that same strain circulates again, you do much better in the future. So by getting our shots every year for flu and COVID, we don't only protect ourselves for that year, but into the future as well, which is a good reason to get it. Uh, all of the vaccine manufacturers have to pre-test and approve for safety reasons all of the vaccines to make sure there's not bad side effects. And there's a very thorough vetting process for that, uh, which has been done. So we'll be ready here this fall for the, the new vaccines. I would not get too hung up or worry about Pfizer or Moderna. They're all great. And this technology has been perfected. So we'll be in good shape uh, for those of you that choose to get the vaccine. Now, I know we can't predict the future with future strains of COVID, but as, as new strains do emerge, do the vaccines change a little bit or how does the vaccine, how, how do medical professionals have to adapt with that vaccine with a new strain of COVID? Yeah, that's exactly right. So we have to always try to stay one step ahead of the virus. So we need to show our immune systems maybe a different part of the virus uh, in order for the immune system to recognize the new strain. So this latest strain called KP is a variant of Omicron and it has switched one of the spike proteins, the outer protein spikes that we're all familiar seeing those pictures. One of those proteins has changed and in so doing it can fool or camouflage itself from our immune system. So the new vaccine says, hey, wait a minute, uh, we're going to we're going to be on the lookout for that so that we can see it, recognize it and knock it out as soon as the patient uh, is exposed to it. And I know we may have some parents here or even elderly people watching. Who should get a vaccine if we're talking age ranges and when? So the CDC is recommending that, you know, all adults get the vaccine, but especially for people that have chronic conditions, chronic heart conditions, uh, diabetes, liver conditions, kidney conditions, because those are the folks who, if you get COVID, might have worse outcomes. Uh, if you are older, uh, if you're older the age of 55, especially 65, it's a good idea to become vaccinated because, again, uh, the virus, flu or COVID, uh, might be bad for you. But also remember this. Often when people get a bad viral condition that affects the lungs, they can, on the heels of that or following it, get a, a nasty pneumonia, a bacterial mm -hmm. infection. And so it's not always just the virus. It's the fact that the virus kind of opens the door to dehydration, to pneumonia, to other problems, asthma exacerbations that can uh, put someone in bad shape. So uh, getting vaccinated if you have a chronic condition or are older is a great idea. And what about for kiddos, Dr. Carlos? At, at what age is it appropriate for them to be considered for the COVID-19 vaccine? So the CDC says everybody over six months, uh, but I, then I think it's up to us as parents to decide. I have three daughters, 12, eight and eight, and they, um, you know, depending on their risk factors, we may choose to get them vaccinated or not, depending on if my in-laws are gonna be hanging out with us this fall mm -hmm. a lot, 
uh, who, one of which is immune suppressed. It might make a lot of sense for my wife and I to vaccinate our kids. So that's a dinner table discussion we're going to certainly be having here shortly. Um, and I'm not worried that the vaccines in and of themselves are going to be dangerous for my kids. I'm actually more worried about uh, my father-in-law and him getting COVID um, because one of my kids got it at school. So it just sounds like maybe an appropriate conversation. It's, it's a family to family basis. So you're gonna have to have that and figure out what is best for you and at what age is best for you. Right. Well, this isn't a one and done vaccine either. There are boosters needed like other vaccines out there. So can you talk about when boosters are needed and when you should wait for the newest booster? Sure, so uh, as the virus mutates or changes, new vaccines come on board. And um, so this fall, the newest vaccine is going to protect us against some of these Omicron strains. Mm -hmm. That's that kind of latest strain. Um, the virus has shown us that it can sometimes mutate quickly with a big mutation. We saw that a couple of years ago in South Africa. We had this incredibly new strain. And remember, we went from the original strain to Delta to Omicron. So the, the timeline or the cadence of vaccination is a little bit up to the virus. Now, that being said, I believe that we can expect this to be a yearly vaccine going with and it's timing with the flu, just because we tend to see a big uptick in viral infections in the fall and heading into the winter months. And unless there is some surprising or big change in the virus, um, I, I kind of think this is going to be an annual vaccine in the fall. And do you feel like it's important to stay with the same um, brand? Like, say, if you get Pfizer, if you decide Pfizer is what you went with the first time, do you have to get Pfizer as the booster? No, nope, I don't think so. I, I don't. I don't see any data that makes me worry that one brand or one type over another. Um, the, the companies have done such a terrific job in getting this right that uh, I think whichever one is available and convenient for you is is perfectly fine. Now, as the COVID-19 just has mutated, right? can you expect or can anybody really expect that there will be more strains as years go by? Is that just, it looks like it's in the cards for this disease? I think so. There's, a, there's two terms, one called pandemic, which means you have this virus that's affected a huge part of the world, pandemic, global pandemic, we're used to that term. And then there's another one that starts with the letter E, endemic, meaning the virus has kind of made itself at home. It's moved in. Uh, it's taken over the guest bedroom, and uh, it's going to keep changing in order to survive. The flu virus is a great example that's done that. So every year in Australia, we start to get a clue about what the new strain of the flu is going to be. That allows vaccine manufacturers here in America to generate the correct vaccine so that when we roll up our sleeves this fall for the flu, we've got a good idea that we're going to be getting the right vaccine for the flu. Now, we're not always 100% perfect. The virus can still change. It might be slightly different from year to year. That's something they always try to get right. I believe COVID will follow a similar path where it's so prevalent and present um, the the family of viruses that COVID is in called coronaviruses, they've been around for decades and decades. And so this is just one member of that family that's decided to move in and take up residence. And I think we'll be with us for a while. Well, I have a few more questions before we uh, stop here, Dr. Carlos. But you've talked about symptoms a little bit. When is it time to get a COVID test? And then on top of that, should you see your doctor? Do you prefer people to see their doctors if they feel like they may have COVID or do at-home tests really work? That's a, that's a great question. A little bit difficult to answer. I'll do my best. I think that if you live with somebody who's at risk for severe infection, uh, somebody who's older, somebody who has a chronic immune condition, somebody on chemotherapy, you should get tested. You should know how to live, work, and interact with that person. If you have any kind of virus, and you have cough and a headache and you're not sure, it really depends on your context and your situation. If you can work from home remotely, work from home. If you have a fever, you wanna make sure you're fever free before you return to work or school. When you do return to work or school, if you have tested and are positive for COVID from a doctor's office or a home test, either are pretty good, uh, it's recommended that you still wear a mask for five days after you break your fever. And the, the idea behind that is that you might still shed or release 
parts of the virus after uh, you are fever free. So those are the kind of the latest recommendations, the best we have right now. Um, your decision on whether or not to check for COVID is probably uh, predicated in large part about who, who you live with and uh, what kind of job you do. Uh, clearly as a doc and my nurses, we wanna know <laughs> if, if we're COVID or not. But if that's not you, if your context is different, um, it's, it's not as important as it was a couple years ago that every time you have a symptom, you get a test. Let's move now to long COVID. We're gonna take a deeper dive into long COVID, but it's in the name. These cases are very unfortunate because the symptoms stick around for a while. So what can you tell us about long COVID and how people can deal with it? So when you get COVID, your body generates an intense inflammatory response. Our bodies do not like COVID at all. And so our immune systems get really amped up. That's why we get the high fevers and your muscles hurt. And that intense immune response and inflammatory response can wreak havoc in certain individuals where even after days and weeks, the inflammation is still there in their brain, in their muscles, leading to fatigue and brain fog. Some folks uh, are afflicted with conditions where their heart rate goes really high called POTS syndrome, ta mm. tachycardia type of syndrome. And um, I have seen dozens and dozens of people with those conditions, but also chronic lung inflammation uh, as well, which we treat sometimes with steroids. It is impossible to tell who is gonna become afflicted with these conditions. That's one of the things that's so difficult. You can be perfectly healthy. You may have run the mini marathon this past May here in Indy and develop symptoms of long COVID. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we try to prevent this and vaccinate because uh, while COVID in and of itself might not be as scary and deadly as it was back in the spring of 2020, the long COVID can really um, be stubborn to deal with and really aff affect people's quality of life. Um, the treatments for it uh, are limited. There is no specific anti-inflammatory. Sometimes we use medications like prednisone, but a lot of times it, it's patients uh, waiting it out uh, and you know working with your doctor to see if you have any of these specific conditions like the tachycardia one I was mentioning. All right, Dr. Carlos, thank you so much for all of these helpful tips and advice when it comes to COVID-19, especially as we start to see cases rise in our area. So thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks, Jessica. To take a deeper dive into where we stand with COVID-19 in the tri-state, we visited with Dr. Gupta from Deaconess Pulmonary Critical Care. We asked Dr. Gupta what we are seeing with COVID recently and about long COVID. I would start with the good news that COVID definitely has gone down. The acute high sickness, what we used to have in ICUs requiring high ventilators, high oxygen requirements have definitely come down. We have another problem of long COVID now, but definitely the acute sickness has come down. Long COVID can be defined as uh, maybe a group of multiple symptoms or just one symptom in a period of three months time, at least three months time after you are recovered from your acute sickness of COVID. So it can be persistent symptoms, relapsing, remitting symptoms, but they should be at least three months staying in your system. Long COVID can be contacted more in people who have comorbid conditions, uh, obese people, high age groups, and people who are very sick on ventilators or required high oxygenations, they are at high risk of getting long COVID. It's very challenging because all the long COVID symptoms are so overlapping with general conditions. So when physicians are seeing those patients, they definitely have to rule out other comorbid conditions and other problems which are overlapping with those symptoms. And once we get those, then we start on the treatment. And unfortunately, we don't have a precise treatment for what we can do for long COVID but we rely on pulmonary rehab or any general rehab and vaccinations and further strengthening of the muscles and anything else we can do to protect their overall symptoms of long COVID. Long COVID is multi-systemic disorder. Overall, you can have brain fogging, you can have shortness of breath, you can have chest pains, you can have palpitations, you can have GI system involved, you can have urinary system involved. Uh, so it's so varied that we have to precisely focus in one organ system and basically rule out any other pathology which can be associated with that and then try to work on symptom approach. And one of the biggest approach is, yes, the rehab exercises 
and uh, kind of dealing with those situations is hard too. Vaccination does prevent the severity of COVID infection. So if you happen to have COVID infection in the near future, your severity of COVID sickness will definitely reduce. Um, there is no big study on that, but definitely we see in our patient population, the severity of having long COVID sickness also decreases if you're vaccinated. And you can still get COVID infection, but definitely your severity will be down. We do see some complications uh, with COVID infection right now. We can randomly get patients who are sick on the ventilators or who require high oxygen. Of course, the risk factors remains the same. They can be comorbid conditions, age factor, and multiple other things. But yes, there, there are some cases in between we are still getting them. Long COVID definitely affects the lungs in various ways. If you have underlying asthma, bronchial asthma, your bronchial asthma can exacerbate or can get into the higher severity. And the same thing with COPD. If you have underlying any stage of COPD, your stage of COPD can get worse with long COVID. Uh, you can also get a solid lung disease, which we call as interstitial lung disease. The good news on interstitial lung disease, which is a solid lung disease, is that the patients do improve in three months, six months' time on that. So I think we have see interstitial lung disease under control, but we do see a lot of patients in our practice having more asthma problems and more COPD problems. So the long COVID is generally picked up by primary care physicians because most of the symptoms are so generalized, like example, brain fogging and cognitive impairments, shortness of breath, chest pains, palpitations. So they first present to the primary care physicians and then solely refer to the subspecialist. The population, what as a lung specialist I see, is more with advanced age, more than 70 years old. And uh, they can have more shortness of breath with their underlying problems getting worse or they develop something new. And we start with initial workup. Unfortunately, there is no blood markers which are helpful in detecting the long COVID. But we start with chest X-ray films and CAT scans approach and see if they have any solid lung disease. And then they will need a breathing test for lung function testing to see if they have any airway disorders, which can be asthma and COPD, maybe a new disease or maybe underlying worsening disease. So patients who have recovered from post-COVID, long COVID syndrome, they can again get the acute COVID-19 infection and they can again get post-COVID long syndrome and they can again get all the multisystemic disorder. You can have one COVID-19 infection and you can develop post-COVID long syndrome. You don't really need to have multiple COVID-19 infections or acute multiple sickness to get long COVID. You can just have it in one infection. Thanks to our guests for joining us to discuss the latest on COVID-19 in the tri-state. I'm Jessica Costello. Thanks for watching WNIN Newsmakers.